Welcome to another episode of Unlock Your Soul with your Suli Anthony Your Soul. This is a space where we scratch beneath the surface to find out what really makes us human. I am with the mayor of Mukuru. <laughs> He's a young gentleman making waves as far as the environment and activism is uh, concerned. He comes from a neighborhood <laughs> that is now literally compared to Marseille in France, to <laughs> East London, <laughs> to, I think, somewhere in Copenhagen, because according to Kenya's president, Mukuru, a slum in Kenya, is so well developed, it's like Europe. So welcome, the mayor <laughs> of Mukuru, resilient Mboya. How are you? I'm good, Asante Sana. Happy to be here. Let's start with the... <laughs> <laughs> with the big elephant in the room. <laughs> the president, whilst on... Um, you know, an intermedia uh, interview compared Mukuru, probably Kenya's second slum, to Europe, to any suburb in Europe. I, I mean, what truth does he have to it? I know there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a project he has in terms of building, you know, uh, in for his houses in Mukuru. But is there some truth to it that Mukuru is close to any suburb in in Europe now? I mean, I was truly shocked yeah. um, beyond my imagination. Yeah. Just the statement uh, being uttered yeah. by our president mm -hmm. comparing my neighborhood, yeah. one that I know very well, yeah. um, to a neighborhood um, in Europe. Yeah. And, you know, like uh, I posted that story and it elicited so many reactions from uh, my small network. And, you know... Mukuru is a neighborhood that is uh, grappled with abject poverty in all its form. You look at housing um, and, and people are living in very small shanties um, in very, very poor conditions. And so I was quite uh, shocked, to yeah. be honest, yeah. because it's unthinkable the magnitude of poverty people living yeah. in Mukuru face. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and you also, I mean, you've grown up in Mukuru you've had a very difficult upbringing. In fact, we were speaking earlier on and you told me from grade three all the way to your high school, uh, some Dutch family was actually paying for your school fees, literally. I mean, t tell us about what it means to grow up in Mukuru and the difficulties in terms of schooling, in terms of food, in terms of health and how paint the picture for us. So Mukuru um, is actually a neighborhood situated uh, just very close to the industrial area. Mm -hmm. It borders um, a number of suburbs. So Donom, mm -hmm. it borders uh, Feather, mm -hmm. it borders Imara Daima. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's located um, in the biggest, it, I mean, in the, in the largest and most populated constituency in Kenya. Mm. People living in Mukuru, Kwanjenga, are some of the world's most poorest mm, mm. Uh, uh, communities. Mm. If you look at uh, the, the the number of people living there, we have close to 300,000 300, people yeah. uh, living very close to each other. And so we have very few social amenities. So I'm talking about healthcare facilities. Um, it's just in the last two years that we've had uh, two uh, healthcare centers, wow. public healthcare centers. Wow. And even with that, we still have um, um, few doctors. Yeah. Um, or, or just absenteeism. They absenteeism, just say, yeah. We're not going to work. Yeah. yeah. And um, people, most families uh, do casual jobs to be able to meet their daily needs. And uh, I can f for sure say that most members of Mukuru um, just leave by mouth, you know? They just find, uh, at least it's very satisfied yeah. satisfied to yeah. find a meal yeah. a day. Yeah. Wow, that's that's very deep. When you say, if I get, I get, I'll be satisfied with whatever happens and I just mm -hmm. move on. So, I mean, going through this very difficult upbringing, were you ever, did you ever feel influenced maybe to, for example, join a gang or, you know, do anything illegal to actually survive? Or was just your sheer willpower to be like, you know what, I have to get out. I have, I have to make something out of myself. 
Um, I grew up. Uh, I grew up uh, with a single mom. Yeah. And my eldest sister, and so. Just like any other kid, yeah. I was exposed to violence yeah. at a very young age. Yeah. Bukuru is a place where um, you'd wake up and 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 someone would and and you'd find like someone has been has been killed yeah. overnight because yeah. he was uh, stealing um, or police brutality. Those are some of the things that I was really exposed um, in my green. Yeah. Yeah. So. And and so many young people are pushed into violence due to um, the family's history of poverty. Mm. So because there's few opportunities, um, I could I could see that in so many other uh, young people. Mm -hmm. But for me, I um, I sort of uh, was also advantaged because uh, my mom was uh, part of this women group, and I used to attend. Uh, some of their programs mm -hmm. they used to run um, a peer counseling and mentorship program that uh, brought uh, youth and children uh, from different parts of Mukuru yeah. to come and discuss issues uh, but also to get educated and to also get social skills to live in such a place but when also it's good that you've mentioned your mom and you know and her peers women are very instrumental in the success of in this this very informal settlements. I mean, they do so much to be able to hold their families. And that's why when we're talking earlier on about climate change and how it, 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 there's a huge issue when it comes to, you know, gender inequality because it affects the women the most and the women have to find solutions to survive. And also coming from a single uh, parent uh, a family, when you look at your mom and you look at how much she, she struggles, now in retrospect, how do you see, how do you view your mom? Um, uh, my mom is a beacon of hope because um, she was very um, involved with community work. And she, w when we speak now and uh, looking back, I see her passion. I still see her passion in like uh, getting involved with uh, matters to do with uh, community engagement. Yeah. Um, and she, uh, with other women, mobilize um, um, different groups uh, within uh, the uh, community to come up with uh, ways they could support their families. Mm. Uh, because you find that uh, so often many uh, women uh, or other uh, young mothers, they have to endure so much uh, to put a meal on table. Yeah, yeah. So I see her as a, as a trail as a trail blazer. Yeah. Uh, because she frontiered so many initiatives um, in our work. Yeah. I mean, when I hear you speak, I I, I don't I don't want to <laughs> take away from everything that you've gone through yeah. to be who you are. But there's also a lot of stereotype when you hear people from the ghetto, from the hood, and how eloquent you are. Does it ever surprise people or does it ever make people think or believe that you are not from the hood? There's no way someone <laughs> is speaking such English and they are from the hood. Does it take away from your story when people suddenly feel like, mm, 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 he can't be from the hood. This guy is too well read. It's not possible. I, I feel flattered, but honestly, it's, uh, it's also perception that uh, people coming from uh, such neighborhood yeah. cannot be able to express themselves yeah. freely and they're not well educated yeah but uh it's also one way that i'm challenging the status quo mm. I've, I've sat on many panel high level panel in different places and cities where i have showed the world that uh, people coming from okuru people yeah. coming from kibera yeah in any other urban yeah. poor communities yeah. around the world yeah they can be able to tell their story, they can able to uh, challenge what mature and experienced uh, yeah. leaders yeah. are failing to do. Now I understand why the president is confusing <laughs> you guys for some city in France, because if he's walking, if he's campaigning Mukuru, <laughs> <laughs> I'm envisioning it, and yeah. he's just like, you know, 
vote for me. And then yeah. there's our lady there saying, can I have a bottle of water? <laughs> <laughs> and someone else is like, oh yeah, please don't forget to bring me my Himalayan salt. And Ziggy, ah, this, <laughs> this hood is so French. This is so yeah. London. What is happening yeah. here? So I blame guys like you, but you are just fresh off the boat, literally, from COP28. And, you know, I was following you and uh, some of the p- panel sessions that you are a part of, some of the breakout sessions that you are a part of. Do these conferences matter as far as the environment is concerned? And also as you begin to also tell us your relationship with environment, with the environment. Yeah. Um, I'll just start um, with um, my experience. Um, getting involved with environmental activism Mm -hmm. uh, for the last uh, six or five years uh, that I've been in this field. So one experience literally changed the course of my life. And uh, that alone made me to be so much dedicated uh, to activism. And it goes back to my community. We had these Sinai fires Mm. in 2012. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, in 2012, in September, um, I'm forgetting the date, but mm. uh, over 100 people were killed yeah. um, in, in, in Sinai fires. Yeah. And, you know, the, the state company, um, over the years, community members had mobilized themselves to call for them to shift from... Uh, to shift to a different place. To shift the pipeline. To shift the pipeline because it was very closely situated to the residential area. Mm -hmm. And you know, you have people living in in, in a house made of iron sheet, which are um, more, I mean, more um, vulnerable to fire um, cases all the time. And... It happened that an oil uh, leaked. And so people desperately rushed to fetch the oil to yeah. be able to sell it. Yeah. At least make 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 a living, you know? Yeah. And that killed over 100 people. Yep. Even innocent. I remember it was devastating. Devastating, it was, right? It was devastating. So back then I was so young. Uh, but I still remember mm. seeing the mutilated bodies mm. of kids, mm. of adults. Mm. And I still see people who uh, have scars in their bodies. And uh, that reminds me of the incident because um, they, they, they still live in those very precarious situations. Yeah, yeah. And so over the years, I um, got so much exposed with my community engagement work and I came to learn that uh, with mainstream um, um, government activities, it's very hard to be hard to be listened to. Mm. And with the likes of people like Boniface Mwangi, who truly inspires me, I saw how he used activism um, to sort of bring out message of uh, we need we need to make changes. Yeah. We need to hold our governments accountable. Yeah. That is when I I um, I explored activism as a way to tell my story. Mm-hmm. So with that experience, I was able to uh, take it in many places. I sat in many platforms. I, Talk to us about some of the places that you've been so we can get context in terms of, you know, just how much work you're doing to, to put this context of, you know, let's take care of our environment, let's take care of our people some of the notable places that you've been to? So I got, uh, I won the UNICEF uh, um, um, essay. Uh, I was among the finalists. And so I participated in UNICEF Youth Cafe. Mm -hmm. And that experience uh, exposed me to uh, London School, um, um, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Mm And they immediately um, onboarded me um, as a youth advisor. Mm. And so I participated at London Climate Action Week Mm -hmm. and was able to bring my story 
which mirrors um, the broader issues happening yeah. at the grassroots level. Yeah. So after that experience, I got involved with um, leaving a legacy, which I work for. Um, I went to uh, the very first COP um, last year yeah. uh, in Egypt, where I also presented our case. Um, and, and, and even regionally, I've participated in different high-level uh, meetings, especially coming from a youth perspective. Yeah. Um, and so it's been, it's been truly inspiring just to be able to get to this position. And, and funny enough, not, not, not hear stories from urban poor communities. People talk about... Um, Ending poverty. Yeah. You look at the sustainable development goal. The very first goal is no poverty. Mm. We don't have a single advocate coming from such a place to advocate for eradication of poverty. Yeah. And so when I go to these UN meetings, that's always my question. You need an advocate. You need a person who has experienced, who has lived in abject poverty yeah. to be able to share their story, mm -hmm. but also to be meaningfully included mm. in, in discussions uh, to do with like, uh, how can we eradicate poverty? Yeah. How can we set up um, targets yeah. which are achievable, yeah. but also include voices and ideas yeah. uh, from these places? I have a very unfair question for you because when I thought about how I, how I drafted this question, it's very unfair because I was like, nobody chooses where they're born. But if you are born rich, do you think these issues would matter to you? I think it goes also back to my personality and also the kind of people um, that mentored me. Yeah. Um, so it kind of shaped me uh, with also how I look mm. at the world. Mm. You know, you can be born in a very privileged place, yeah. but also dedicate your life uh, to supporting those who are less yeah. vulnerable. Yeah. So I, I, ju I just tend to think I'll still... It's about character. Yeah, it's about character. Yeah. So I'll still um, choose to do something uh, yeah. for communities or for any other people. With, with all the high-level events that you've been to, with you know a lot of the drama surrounding you know things like COP28 and the, the huge number of delegates that the, that, the, that the Kenyan government, for example, would send out. I mean, we're talking about 700 people who would easily be a good conference in Nairobi yeah. to deal with Kenyan issues on their own and then send one representative. Do you feel like there is, do you, do you feel, do you see, do you experience any change as far as matters, environment and advocacy is concerned? Or do you just feel like we have a long way to go and people understand that this is a real, it's not a money-making scheme, this is the real deal? Yeah, so I just want to share this for the very first time. Yeah. Here, part of part of my travel, yeah. I've been able also to pay for that. Mm. I've been able to fundraise. Mm -hmm. So I've not been able just to get packages. Uh, yeah, because per you're, DMs. You're, not, you're not you're not with the government. Yeah. You you're you're on your own. Yeah. Literally. And so most of my travels and most of the places I've been to, I've been able to uh, speak to my. A small network. Yeah. Uh, speak to organization I work with. Yeah. To be able to uh, finance myself to go to this event. Yeah. So it really annoys me. Um, last year I went to COP27, and I could see a number of um, Kenyan delegates. Yeah. Attending the forum. Yeah. With no clue. Yeah. Of what they're doing. Yeah. This exactly. Guy, this guy came for a shopping spree. So they're going around in different pavilions. You yeah. know. Yeah. I don't drinking wine. <laughs> Let, let's just be honest. They're probably enjoying the wine. Wine, sampling, and networking, taking photos, and asking, all that. Asking Juma where he got his shoes. Yeah, so I want to buy shoes like those. <laughs> it's 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 waste of uh, public resources. Yeah. Yet we have people like Juma, who are doing uh, incredible work at the grassroots level. Yeah. That needs to. But when be, you look around, you're like, yeah, my peers are not there. They're not there. Which means, who's really for us? Who's really for us? Yeah. You know, yeah. you have organization that are supposedly representing urban poor communities. Mm. They fail to recognize you. Mm. But uh, I must say, you might not be recognized locally, but you can be recognized anywhere. Yeah. My work has been um, uh, published and uh, shared in in, uh, in different places. Yeah. But when it comes to our local um, 
areas, yeah. it's hard yeah. to work even with these organizations yeah. that have mandate mm. to work with young people coming from these areas to listen to their ideas, but also like to include them in their decisions. So, so now you're sitting at a, at a, you know, at a meeting with the president, the deputy president, some certain ministers and influential people. There's likes of you, Akina, Juma, I mean, all these people, you know, your peers. And you, it's your time to present to the, to the president and yeah. give him your five points, you know, ideas that you feel like this is what I feel like you need to do so we can be able to move from this step to this step. And we can also be as, we cannot be complainer, mumblainer. Yeah. When we go to this, we can also be like, oh, these guys are with their limited resources. They are doing X, X, X because they've made X, X, X choices. What is, what is your five point uh, you know, uh, intervention, uh, analysis or idea that you can share with the president in this room and tell him, and he gives you a free fall and tells you, whatever five ideas you have, I'll give you the money to implement them. What are these five ideas? So it's interesting. I met uh, the president mm. just before he, he, um, he got interviewed by CNN in Dubai. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just a rush of a moment. Yeah. I really wanted to ask him about the housing um, yeah. mm. b uh, bill yes. that um, is really yeah, pushing, um, for. pushing for. Yeah. One, you cannot craft a, a, an urban housing scheme without listening to the people who live there. Yeah. Without the urban poor. Without the urban poor. Yeah. So he has this very ambitious yeah. project. Yeah. Yet it lacks information. Mm. It lacks ideas. Mm. It lacks the needs. It lacks assessment. Participation. From participation from yeah. people coming from uh, um, um, such a place. Yeah. So while listening to him recently, I was shocked. He needs to ensure that we have strengthened public participation forum yeah. where people come um, and they discuss issues, but also like have, make a follow-up. You know, you, they can come and discuss. Many a times I attend this public participation forum. Yes. We have our ideas captured, but that is not reflected in implementation mm, processes. Mm, mm. So we have to strengthen these uh, uh, public participation uh, mechanisms to be able to not only capture, but also like work out a way that uh, we'll have follow-up and we'll have activities that people have identified to be able to uh, be implemented. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you cannot also um, think of building houses in places where people already exist mm. without figuring out where these people are going, mm. you know? I have lived my whole life in Mukuru Kwanjenga. I moved uh, just close to, to Mukuru yeah. because I still want to yeah. um, remain involved with our community work. Yeah. So you cannot tell me you have this idea of like building um, an ambitious housing project and then moving out people. These are not dogs. Yeah. These are people. Yeah. You know, so you have to figure out, are we going to compensate them? Are we going to re, uh, locate them to a different location? We have or to figure out. Are we making them the first owners of these houses? Yeah. Because the biggest issue even now with the people on the ground is they're saying that this urban housing development project is that they're afraid we'll literally have new landlords from yeah. other areas yeah. coming to own these houses. So the people the on the ground, are they going to be the ones who are given first priority? to own those houses. Yeah, here's the thing. We're not refusing development. Yeah. Of course, we want to live in decent places. Yeah. We want to have... Uh, we, have we want to have nice place, yeah. right? Yeah. But we also want us to be listened. Yes. So, there's a wrong message that is going around. Yeah. People from Ukuru, people from Kibera, people from Dandora, or any other urban poor community in Nairobi, they're not refusing development. They want to be part and parcel of that um, decisions yeah. being made. Yeah. So it's a, it's a matter of listening to us and enabling, seeing us as enablers mm. because we have a vision, yeah. you know? But now, actually, it's good to say that now my philosophical mind is beginning to tell me that there is a correlation between a, a, a poverty and policy in the sense that the poorer you are, 
the lesser of a say you have as far as policy and implementation is concerned. Mm -hmm. Whilst the richer or the more enabled you are, the more you're allowed a seat on the table to have a conversation around your security, around your environment, around what you can become, around what affects you. Yeah. But the poorer you are, you don't have a say. Shut up, sit, and let us tell you how things are gonna go. So the idea of that when you're poor, we are trying to create these decent living conditions for you. But also, you should not speak. Why are you speaking? See, you're poor and the ones, we're the ones who know how we can get out of poverty. Mm. So keep quiet. So now that I've thought about it, there's literally, there's a condescending attitude mm -hmm. towards the poor. That you will remain as poor as you, as you, as you, as we will. Mm -hmm. And when we try to get you out of it, you shouldn't talk. Your talking or your having a say is basically you trying to mess with the status quo mm -hmm. and we can take it away from you. Yeah. See, you, you're trying to argue with us. We can as well take these houses and take them to people who are, who are more thankful of the opportunity. Well, it shouldn't be like that. Governments mm -hmm. are not here to, to be pleased. Yeah. They're here to please the people, not mm -hmm. to be pleased. So I'm, I'm really finding it very... Now I'm... You see, when I sit in my house and I listen to this conversation, it might not affect me, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I may not care. Because mm -hmm. to me, I'm like, ah, you know, it's another story. But there's people, human beings, who are actually affected on the ground in Mokuru, mm -hmm. in Kibera, in Kawangware, in all these places, when they are told, move out, mm -hmm. and we want to build a new. What happens? Where is their voice? You know? Mm -hmm. So... Anyway, um, um, <laughs> I don't want to be so yeah. like angry black man. No, it's yeah. okay. It's okay actually to be, to be angry because I read an article that said, um, you see all these movements that have been happening around. Yeah. Um, the more angry you become, yeah. the more, um, the more you challenge. Yeah. Um, um, the. The government yeah. to respond to your issues. Yeah. I remember we've had so many encounters in Mukuru. I have a friend called um, uh, Daudi Anamiture. Yeah. He won the Human Rights uh, Defender Award. Mm. For mm. him, mm. help mobilize young people mm -hmm. uh, because we had we in Mukuru we've had so many issues of land grabbing. Yeah. So it happened that we had like a public school that was grabbed and uh, developed by a private um, uh, big man. Yeah, the audacity. <laughs> and it was through anger that we were able um, to return back the public school. Mm. So right now we have a public school and I can tell you for sure, it was due to anger yeah. that we stormed that exactly, school. Exactly, yeah. We we used power. You made noise. <laughs> we made noise. We were talking about this before when you went <laughs> when you went to the dispensary, the hospitals, and you couldn't get any service. And I told you how one time <laughs> I went to the national Nairobi City Water and Siwa Ridge Company, you know, offices, and they couldn't give me service. And I've been there for three hours. And I there's people, there's Kenyans who are there for six hours and who are yeah. like, and I was asking them, why are you guys okay with this? And they're like, now what do you want us to do? Mm -hmm. I'm like, what do you mean? We have a voice. <laughs> yes. We just make, no and you know the thing is, when you make the noise there, these guys don't know where we live. Exactly. So and already we don't have we don't have water, so they're gonna catch it twice. No. Yeah. So we just make. So I started making noise. I started making noise. Mm. So what I did, I'd go to the wall and read their vision mission statement. Mm. And start saying, you guys are saying that your job is to serve in a timely manner, and you're not serving us in a timely manner. Now I was making all the noise mm. till the boss, when she landed, she was like, I'm at the parking lot and I have a huge voice and I'm hearing noise in the offices. What is mm. happening? She drove with me. I got a free oh. ride home <laughs> <laughs> to come and check how comes we haven't had water yeah. in like a year. Wow. We've always been buying water. We've never had water running in our yeah. taps. And that's how my problem was fixed. And you should have seen the guys next to her pretending like, oh, they were trying to help fix it mm. because they, they just didn't care. And we've spoken about this and how co colonialism is literally the reason why we are in this problem. In the sense that the colonialists transferred this lack of empathy yeah. to seeing other human beings as animals. Mm. That anybody who took over power, anybody who's in power, when we talk about the city council, when we talk about the, the government of the day, when we talk about service providers, when we talk about civil servants, they see other human beings as, as, as others. Exactly. Yeah. And you must part 
you must part with money mm. you must part with something for that to replace the lack of empathy with service so it's it's very disheartening mm. that that you know that there must be a transfer exactly, and, and, yeah. and in your case that somebody for mm. them to gain uh, a land they must transfer mm. money to whoever so they can get public land land where children should be playing because and i saw a video yesterday um on ntv where uh, i i mean kids were playing next to the women where they're selling their wares yeah. on the street that's just and it's been so normalized it's insane that when people like you you know you come out of of mukuru it's it's like to be honest it's very commendable because your type my type were never meant to make it mm. they just won't allow us to make it yeah. so it's very it's 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 very uh, you know disheartening tell us about living a legacy what the organization is for what you do there what does it stand for and and how and and the kind of legacy that you want to leave so earlier on i mentioned uh, i'm the east africa project coordinator mm-hmm. uh, for living a legacy how old are you i'm 23 you're like 12 <laughs> And you're East Africa project coordinator. I'm a project coordinator. You're like 12 years old. You just look like you look like you finished school yesterday. I, I don't know yeah. if it's the food you're eating. I don't, I don't know what's happening. Or is, is it the frequent flights? You know what? No, you, no, you and Juma look like you should be in school. I don't know what's happening. No, no, no. Yeah. So um, I was saying, uh, actually, East Africa, East Africa project coordinator for yeah. living a legacy. Yeah. We are an organization uh, based in the UK, but have operations here in East Africa. Mm-hmm. So one of the biggest, one of our biggest mandate is we are championing environmental work mm-hmm. at the grassroots level. Mm-hmm. Our founder formed, uh, founded uh, Living a Legacy because she was so uh, passionate um, with the grassroots work that is being accelerated um, yet with very few funding. Mm. And so we are using a criteria to identify one vulnerable uh, communities, mm-hmm. um, the kind of project they want to scale, but also like the people who are running these initiatives. Mm-hmm. Because more, more often we find uh, people running uh, some initiatives, they pocket lots of money. Yeah. But for us, we are more interested in the kind of work that is being accelerated. Mm-hmm. And so it is through that that we've been able this year so far to work with uh, communities um, through our transformative climate workshop series, whereby we're using climate education um, to identify uh, such communities, including Tasafi. Um, in in, uh, in a coastal area, we've been able to plant mangrove, um, which is... Uh, a huge and ambitious project yeah. that is creating livelihood yeah. but also mangroves are known as um I'm forgetting this word but uh they are, they hold a lot of carbon yeah and so local communities in that area are investing their time their resources in ensuring that the biodiversity in that area mm. is protected and maintained mm. Mm. so Living a Legacy also has, uh, we've launched an app and uh, we are having uh, climate uh, educations, we are having resources, we are having um, communities being created whereby we can help fund and and help them to mobilize resources to scale up mm-hmm. their work. I love that. What about you personally? What legacy would you like to leave when you think about how difficult your bringing has been and how you've gone through you know those bumps and potholes to be who you are today what legacy would you like to leave uh, this earth you know, we talk about the environment yeah wangari masai talks about you know that little thing that you know that you you love and you passionate about that you hold on to it and you make something out of it so what's your little thing and how do you intend to leave a legacy out of it it's a big question uh, but for me is I want to leave this world um, with kids um, living in urban poor communities, mm-hmm. seeing that they can 
ch- make changes mm. around the world. Mm. Kids who are growing in these very difficult places. Yeah. We are having so many families that are plunged into poverty. I want them to see that they can make changes. Yeah. And the small changes they they're making already that can be um that can be a source of inspiration yeah. to the generations to come. That nothing is too small yeah. Yeah. that uh they should not be um sort of discouraged mm. because of their environment. Mm. They should take that as an um an experience yeah that can challenge exactly uh, so and, as, many and a stepping stone to, and to be resilient yeah <laughs> to be resilient. don't you say that you, <laughs> my legacy is i want to i want to have i was like kids <laughs> i was like what do you mean you want to have kids like many children i was like what is <laughs> then i was oh it's the kids the inspiration yeah also, you that sh- after all these great things you've done your legacy is to have many that children. should be kind honestly <laughs> <laughs> no, we're keeping it like that. Anyway, thank you, Mboya. Thank you for always having a smile, regardless of everything that you've gone through. So your, you know, as we as we conclude, uh, first and foremost, how can people reach you if they want to reach, leave, in, leave a legacy? Can they email you? Uh, you know, I, I always leave everyone's information on the on the caption, but I realize I think when you say it, people will they will stick with it. So how can they get in touch with you if they want to? So um, you can follow me on my social uh, media platforms, uh, on Facebook, on Instagram, uh, Resilient Boy. Mm-hmm. But also you can um, email me at joffreylivingalegacy.com. Uh, cool. Do you, do you fast? Um, at times. I do first. Yeah, I mean, people people like you who are just skinny naturally and some of us who <laughs> smell fries and add weight because <laughs> that's fasting. But anyway, so on, in my pocket roomy here, this is my word for you. Fast from thoughts. Fast. Thoughts are like the lion and the wild ass. Men's hearts are the thickets they haunt. Fasting is the first principle of health. Restraint is superior to medication. Scratching only aggravates the itch. Fast and behold the strength of the spirit. So go on and fast. Asante sana. If you under, if you get it, you get. If you don't, forget about it. Don't forget <laughs> to go to our social media handles at Unlock Your Soul Podcast on TikTok, Instagram, and of course here on YouTube. Make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe, and hit that notification button. Button and make sure yeah, you tell everybody about this guy, Joffrey Boya, as seen on CNN now. On Unlock Your Soul. Keep it locked. I want to remind you to unlock your soul with Anthony Your Soul. All you got to do is make sure you like every video on this platform. Please comment, share, subscribe, and hit that notification button. And let us unlock our souls.